Hello and welcome. This is United States History 12. This is the first lecture in a series of lectures that will take us from the period of time from Reconstruction to the modern era. All right, well, let's begin. We'll begin with the presidential election of 1868, a period of time that is not too long away or too far away from the Civil War. It's a period of time in which U.S. Grant is going to run and successfully become the President of the United States, winning by a slim margin of victory, about 300,000 votes, and this was mainly due to the fact that several southern states' ballots hadn't been counted as they had been unreconstructed as of that time. So Grant's victory was owed in large part to the recent, or fairly recent, allowance of former slaves to be able to vote. To give you an idea of the atmosphere during this period of time, we only have to look at the incidence of the so-called bloody shirt. When a member of the House of Representatives will stand up before Congress waving a supposed bloody nightshirt of someone who had gone into the South, a so-called carpetbagger, and he, being unwelcomed, will be greeted by clansmen who will flog him. And this shirt then was presented to members of Congress as evidence that the South was still unbowed and they needed to be uh, taken care of. But this is also the era of good stealings, with Grant's winning presidency coming into office. Things are good for lots of people. The Era of Good Stealings is kind of a play on the earlier era in American history, the Era of Good Feelings, which had taken place after another war in American history, the War of 1812, in which America had been divided during that war as well. Some of the northern states had actually contemplated seceding from the Union. And at the end of the war, the feeling was one of America being incredibly proud of its achievement of having stood up against the power of Great Britain for the second time this time, more or less, standing on our own, without much in the way of aid or assistance, and doing fairly well against, at that time, the world's most powerful nation, Great Britain. But here we are at the end of another war in American history, the end of the Civil War, and we are not unified. Southern states are still rebellious. Many of the areas of the South are under military command. And yet, this is a period of time in American history in which there are fortunes to be made. There had been fortunes made during the Civil War by fair and by unfair methods, 
There was the atmosphere during the Civil War of a desperation to win, and the government of the North especially, to win by outspending the South. The North had spent freely during the Civil War. They'd, uh, for example, will purchase horses, sight unseen, because they were desperate and in need of horses. And, of course, there were unscrupulous individuals who were all too willing to make a little extra money on the side uh, from a government that would pay top dollar for horses sight unseen. So unscrupulous individuals would go out, buy horses that were really unfit for service. Horses that had been, for example, sold to glue mills. Places that would transform horse meat into glue. And then they would sell these horses that were barely alive, many of them. And when the government came to collect them, well, they handed over the money anyway, because, hey, they're horses, they had contracted, been fulfilled. So there was this atmosphere in America during the Civil War that if you had enough guts, you could go out there and make a fortune. Whether it was legal or illegal, didn't really matter. People were spending money all over the place in the Civil War. In fact, uh, there is a famous incident in which paper manufacturers wanted to get in on the deal as well. So they came up with a nifty idea, an idea that would try to save the government of the United States a little money. Now, in those days, shoes were all handmade leather products, and the government bought lots of them for their soldiers. And because the soldiers had to march around all over the place, they generally wore out fairly quickly. And these were fairly expensive items. So the paper companies hatched a plan to make a bit of money, and they thought maybe it might even save the government some money. So what it was was that the paper companies proposed to the government of the United States that paper in the form of kind of a waxed cardboard would be shaped like shoes and soldiers could wear these. Now, they were very inexpensive. Obviously, they're not going to last as long as a leather shoe. But because they were so inexpensive, you could buy several of these and still save money. And it was claimed that this, these paper shoes would save the government money because they may only last a couple of weeks, but they were so inexpensive that you could buy several of them and it would outlast the wear time of a good leather shoe. So the government could save a bit of money that way. Now, it came to be found out, of course, that these paper shoes didn't last nearly as long as the claim. But by that time, the government had purchased quite a number of these paper shoes, and the paper companies had made a, a good profit off of this as well. So everybody was looking to get rich from the government. Well, not everybody, but quite a number of people were looking to make a living, a killing, off of the federal government. And that carries over into this period of time after the Civil War as well. So it's come to be known as the era of good stealings. 
There are many examples of what is meant by this. I've only put a few of these down for you. So let's go through those. At this time, the United States is comprised of some 39 million people. The war and its aftermath had bred waste, extravagance, and graft. There was so much money thrown about, and a lot of it falls into the hands of the wrong people. Definition for an honest politician at that time was one who, once they'd been bought, would stay bought. So, first off, we've got Diamond Jubilee Gem Fisk and Jay Gould. Two individuals who had worked together in a number of business dealings, and they had decided to gather together one more time to make a real big killing. Now, these were two individuals who were very different from one another, both physically and socially. Uh, Jubilee Jim was an individual who liked to make money, was good at making money in a variety of different ways, and having made his money, he will spend extravagantly on what was claimed to be things like uh, fast horses and even faster women. On the other hand, his partner, Jay Gould, was his opposite in a number of different ways. One, he was uh, thin, as opposed to Fisk's being uh, rather heavy set. But the other was that Gould was kind of a miser, penny pincher. It's the kind of guy that you might see represented on one of those television series like Extreme Money Savers. Uh, he would not be known for his extravagance, but even with his saving schemes, he always wanted more money. So the two of them came up with an idea to make a good deal more money than they had ever made before. One of the ideas that they came up with they were going to put into place was to try and corner the gold market. And cornering the gold market or cornering any market in the stock market is where you have purchased so much of this particular item that you now control it. You can determine its price, whether it will go up or down. In this case, what they wanted to do was to control the gold market. Unfortunately, gold was the standard of money in America at this time, which meant that the money of the United States, paper money, was tied to the price of gold. So if the price of gold went up, then the value of the American greenbacks, the dollars, paper money, would go up as well. If it went down, then the value of the American dollar also went down. So the federal government had decided to try and stabilize the currency by stabilizing the price of gold. So the practice of the government was that if the price of gold went up, generally meant that the spot market for gold uh, was short on the availability of gold. So the government would take gold out of reserve, put it onto the market, and the price of gold would go down. If it went down too low, they would then begin to buy up gold so that the price would go up. The scarcity would cause the price to rise. And in this way, the price could be stabilized and the American currency could be stabilized. So Fisk and Gould had the problem of 
the government of the United States. They couldn't quite corner the gold market and determine the price, making it rise dramatically and then selling off quickly and making a fortune, because the government could step in and ensure that the price wasn't going to rise very quickly. But in those days, everybody knew that with a little bit of luck, a little bit of pluck, and some cash, the wheels of industry could be greased and you could get what you wanted done. And in this case, Fisk and Gould found an individual who claimed, at least, that he had the ability to speak to the President of the United States and present the idea of making money, not just for Fisk and Gould, but also to open up the marketplace for real marketeers, to allow the free and unfettered market of gold, which, of course, is going to be good for business. Now, of course, this individual was one of the President of the United States' brothers-in-law. Grant's background, his um, own personal history, is rather an interesting one. He had a number of different brothers-in-law whom he had a very close relationship with before he'd been president, before he'd gained notoriety in the Civil War as the commander of the Northern Armies, general in charge, below, of course, the leadership of Lincoln. Grant had been in a number of business ventures with his brothers-in-law, and he had come to trust them. So this brother-in-law of Grant's claimed to Ghoul and Fisk that he could convince his brother-in-law to accept the idea of allowing the gold market to be free and unfettered and allowing it to ride the horizon freely. And Fisk and Gould became good friends with this brother-in-law of Grant, to the point where they uh, went out to dinner together, and of course, hey, he didn't need to pay for dinner. These were rich gentlemen, and he was their friend. They'd go out to uh, the theater together, and eventually they will loan him a good deal of money as well. With, of course, the idea that this brother-in-law was going to help them in the future. So, eventually, uh, this brother-in-law will approach his uh, brother-in-law, the President of the United States, and present this idea of allowing the gold market to be unshackled, unchained, and allowing it to be free and open. The President said it was out of his hands, that this was something that Congress had authorized and that he couldn't violate this without breaking the law. So there wasn't anything that he could do about it. At that point, Grant's brother-in-law was heartbroken. He knew that his good friends who had loaned him a lot of money were going to be disappointed. So disappointed that they were probably going to want their loaned money, loaned out at no interest, loaned out with the idea that, hey, it can be repaid when you repay it. We're good friends. But of course, with this devastating news, even he realized that it would be very likely 
that they would want their money back now. And of course, he'd already spent it, or at least most of it. So, what was he going to do? Should he go back to them, tell them the truth? He would be financially ruined, would be a great scandal, who knows what might happen to him. So instead, he went back to them and told them, yes, indeed, he had spoken to the president. Yes, indeed, the president had agreed with him that it was a good idea. And he then told a small fib, little lie, that the president would indeed allow the market to run free. So, Fisk and Gould now given assurance the market was going to be free and open, rubbed their hands together in glee and excitement and went off to buy up as much gold as they could. Meanwhile, the brother-in-law packed up his bags and sailed off to Europe, where Fisk and Gould would not be able to get a hold of him. Meanwhile, Fisk and Gould are off buying their gold, expecting the price to go up, and it does. But not too long after that, the federal government will step in, insert more gold onto the market, and the price comes down. Fisk and Gould will sell off their shares of gold as quickly as they can at that point, realizing that they'd been lied to. So they really didn't lose a whole lot of money, but they certainly hadn't gained money. And so they were very disappointed, so disappointed that uh, they began to publicly exclaim against the president's brother-in-law, so much so that eventually the papers picked up on this. They put these stories. Uh, there were rumors circulating around that the president had been in on the deal, that maybe he had violated the law, but the president hadn't. Eventually, people will realize this. But certainly the idea that even the president of the United States could be bribed to break a law was not beyond reasonable doubt for many people in America at this time. As I've said before, the old saying of uh, the only honest politician is one who will stay bribed after you've bribed him was very common. And that would rise all the way up to the level of the President of the United States. So many people were all too willing to believe that the President may well have gone through with this scheme. But since he didn't, eh, nothing illegal, nothing you could impeach him on. Another example is the actions on a city level a politician by the name of William Boss Tweed, the boss of bosses of New York City. This was a politician who knew that pretty much everybody could be bought for the right price. Voters, for example, could be bribed. Even today, politicians bribe voters to vote for them. Vote for me and I'll make sure that such and such will be done for your benefit. But in those days it was much more direct, much more individualized. Vote for me and I will ensure that you personally will have a job in the government. You personally will benefit. You, you, your kids need shoes, fine, we can get your kids shoes. They need jackets for the winter, not a problem. Personal favors were performed in order to gain votes. <laughs> and this worked really, really well, especially in the poorer sections of the city where individuals were desperate. And desperate people will take what's handed to them. 
If someone says, hey, vote for Joe Schmo, and once he's in, you're with us, and the sky's the limit. And these politicians were fairly straightforward in that. Once you'd voted for them, and in those days there was no secret ballot, they knew who you would vote for. And so they check, oh yeah, you did vote for Joe Schmo. Hey, you're with us, not a problem. Come on in. The city's our oyster. Just reach in and steal all the pearls. So, Tweed was a guy who got the vote out. He'd send a lot of people out into the poor districts, round up the vote, bribery if uh, necessary. Sometimes all it took was uh, a few drinks, sometimes a, a lunch, sometimes just a slap on the back, a smile, and sometimes a promise, promise of a job, promise of something for your children, something that would help your family. Now, not everybody was happy with this, of course, because in order to pay off these bribes for votes and to reward the politicians who would be put into these positions so that they could gain more than just their salaries, very often that meant that in the city government, Projects would be handed over to people who would give kickbacks. People who would bid, say, um, $100,000 for the rights to uh, take all the garbage out of the city. Now, that would be generally more expensive than a competitive vote for that same contract that might have been bid at, say, $10,000. That extra money was then pocketed by Tweed and handed out, distributed to the various people who had uh, helped secure these votes. So everybody was getting a bit of cash from all of this. But not everybody was happy about it. Not everybody was being bribed in this way. The wealthy, middle class, by and large, weren't. And so newspapers began to publish stories about this graft and crime and corruption. And there was a great cry that went out to try and clean up government. Not everyone was happy about the situation because the city government, having spent so lavishly on hiring many of these cronies of Tweed, that the government of New York didn't have sufficient funds to be able to do all that was necessary. Roads that needed to be fixed didn't have the, the funds to be able to fix them. Parks weren't cleaned and... Uh, taken care of properly because they couldn't hire the numbers of people that they needed to do this. So certain parts of the city were becoming run down. But certainly many people were benefiting from this. Well, eventually, Tweed is arrested on charges of uh, corruption, and he is tried and convicted and sentenced, and the individual who will finally bag Boss Tweed, finally successfully prosecute him, is an individual who will earn 
a good deal of political reputation as a result of this, and it will be used as a springboard for political office for him. The prosecutor will then become governor of New York, and then he will uh, later run as a candidate for president of the United States. And so this is another example of the shenanigans that's going on in America at this time. Another example is, of course, Grant's brothers-in-law, some of whom were in government positions placed there by Grant and as the President of the United States has the power to appoint individuals into certain government positions. And, of course, members of Congress wanting to curry favor with the President of the United States will authorize Grant's brothers-in-law into these positions, even though they didn't have the qualifications to fill these vacancies in the government. There were many vacancies in government that will go to not just Grant's brothers-in-law, but to other individuals. Good jobs in the federal government, where you didn't have to do very much, but you were paid quite a bit. An example of this type of government job is where there would be a small house next to a bridge in which the job of the individual living in that house would be to watch for boats traveling along the river. Seeing one, they would then raise the bridge to allow the boat to pass through, and then they'd lower the bridge. Now, if this were a place where this happened quite frequently, then their being paid for this job might actually be uh, of value. But generally, these were jobs where this was done only on a very rare occasion, maybe once a month. So these were easy jobs that paid quite well. So they were handed out as rewards to individuals who had been loyal to the party, or loyal to Grant, or other members of the political party, as favors, as a way to repay them, but also to show to other people, hey, if you're loyal to the party, you do what we want, you'll be rewarded too. So, there were a number of people from newspaper stories who were very upset with Grant having appointed members of his family to these positions. It wasn't illegal for him to do so. Certainly, he could hire anyone that he wanted to for these positions. There were no job qualifications for these positions. So, it wasn't illegal, but... Everybody knew uh, yeah, right, that perhaps this wasn't the best thing to do. The president was using the government for uh, his and his family's benefit. Another example is the whiskey ring. The whiskey ring is the story where a group of businessmen, distillers who manufactured whiskey, felt that they were unduly being punished by the government where many other alcoholic beverages weren't being taxed, whiskey was. So they'll take out their frustrations on this uh, unfair tax by trying to compel the government to overturn the tax. When that failed, they will then turn to illegal means. 
And the means that they will employ is finding an individual in the government, in this case the president's private secretary, who knew the location of where the government stored these stamps, the stamps that would be placed on bottles of whiskey to show that the federal tax had been paid on those bottles, where those stamps were located so that the distillers could come in, take the stamps, and then use them, place them on the bottles of whiskey and say, hey, see, we've already paid the tax on this. We don't have to pay tax on it now. Eventually, the federal government will realize that millions of money that should have been coming in weren't. And for the first time in American history, the Treasury Department will send out agents undercover to try and discover what was going on. And they will find that these distillers had been using stolen excise tax stamps and eventually they will trace it back to the individual who had sold the location and the means of getting into these warehouses where the stamps were being stored and that it was the president's private secretary. Having been arrested for this, he'll be tried, very public trial. Uh, the newspapers and many other people will hint very strongly that as the president's private secretary, the president probably was aware of what was going on, but they couldn't prove it. So it might be possible that the president could have received some of this money, but it could be proved. And it's really unlikely that Grant took any kind of bribe to allow this to happen anyway. Grant wasn't above schemes, but legal schemes. They might skirt the law, but they wouldn't break the law. But many people believed that the president was fully capable of doing this. Everyone was capable of doing this at whatever level of government, from city, state, to federal. Everyone believed that politicians were out to benefit themselves before they benefited anyone else. Another example is that of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Bureau of Indian Affairs in the War Department it was one of the departments within the War Department. And the Secretary of War was an individual named Belknap. B-E-L-K-N-A-P, Belknap. And he was an individual who wanted to use government to enrich himself. So what he did was he will make money by selling contracts to private individuals to set up trading posts on Native American land. Now these trading posts could be quite lucrative. Originally they were set up, these trading posts were set up on Native American land because much of the Native American land was not the best. As a result, very often these Native Americans would be in need of a variety of different types of things that they themselves couldn't get from the land. So the government will set up these trading posts to allow Native Americans to trade various things that they could find on their land for things that they wouldn't be able to make themselves. Steel knives, things of that nature. 
like a not just a um, like a department store. So many of these trading posts could be quite lucrative. People could get rich from them by, of course, cheating the Native Americans. So Belknap sold contracts to individuals who gave him kickbacks, who would give him money under the table. And eventually, of course, this was found out. Congress will then vote to impeach him, forcibly remove him from office, but he'll resign and eventually face criminal charges for his actions as well. But again, it just goes to show that everyone, leaders, followers, no matter what position you held in government, you would try to use it for your own benefit. And of course, another example is that of the Credit Mobile. Credit Mobile was a way by which railroad executives could gain vast sums of money for themselves. Now, they were already making massive amounts of money. So much money that many of these railroad executives were multimillionaires in a time in which there was no income tax and a time in which most people generally didn't earn much more than a dollar or two a day. So these were individuals who could build fabulous homes for themselves, some of them even having uh, gold roofs. Some of them, as an example, would have very elaborate dinner parties where they would spend lavishly. Uh, there was the story of one railroad executive who wanted a very large dinner party and he'll create uh, a table handmade just for this occasion in which a toy train would be built just for this occasion. A toy train large enough to have platters on it and it would ride around the table and it would stop every so often and the guests then would scoop out their food from the railroad cars. And it was quite exciting, quite fun, quite expensive. And of course, at the end of the meal, party favors would be handed out by this toy train as well. The box cars would be filled with sand. The guests would be given uh, sterling silver shovels to dig through the sand in these railroad box cars and find their party favors, which would be things like instead of little uh, plastic cheap rings or little noisemakers, they would find diamond rings or pearl necklaces or uh, ruby earrings or something of this nature. So these were very wealthy individuals. But of course, nobody has enough money we always want more, and these people were no exception. So they came up with a scheme where they could make even more money from the government. The government had been paying railroad companies to create railroads out west out west where there were very few people, out west where there were great distances between towns, and railroad companies would not normally have built out there because they really wouldn't make a whole lot of money this way. But the government subsidized 
the building of these railroads. They would grant to the railroad companies vast amounts of land that the railroad companies would then sell to real estate developers, and the real estate developers would subdivide them, and they would sell them to individuals for farms. They would sell them uh, to a whole series of individuals, anybody that wanted to buy. So there was money to be made that way. There was also uh, compensation that the federal government would pay to the railroad companies for each mile of track that they would lay to help compensate them for uh, the money that it would cost them to build railroad. And of course the government would pay them more than it was actually going to cost to build those railroads. So they made money. But it wasn't enough. They wanted more. So they came up with this scheme where they created a company, Credit Mobiliere, that was supposed to save money. Whenever the railroad companies went in to buy things that they would need to build the railroads, people would say, ah, oh, railroad companies have got lots of money. Let's raise the price. So the railroad executives would claim that using this company would allow them to purchase at wholesale prices things that they needed to build the railroads and that this would save them money and that money could then be passed on to the federal government. But of course the Credit Mobiliere never really bought anything. It only made out phony receipts for items. And those bills would be presented to Congress, and Congress would say, oh, okay, well, we need to pay you for this. So the railroad companies made a good deal of money. It's kind of like printing their own money in this way. Oversight committees, which had been created in Congress to ensure that things like this didn't happen, looked the other way because many of the members of Congress whose job it was to oversee railroad companies had been bribed by being given shares in this company, the Credit Mobile. So as it was doing well, they were doing well. But if they were to step in and say, oh, this company isn't doing anything, we've got to shut it down, they would lose a good deal of money. So there were a number of members of Congress who would look the other way at these actions. But eventually, of course, it will be found out. A newspaper reporter will expose it. A couple of members of Congress will be censored as a result of this. Shockingly, they will be shown to have been directly bribed even the Vice President of the United States was shown to have accepted some stock in this company as well. So the fix was in. People were quite upset that the government could be used in this manner for the gross benefit of large companies enriching the few at the expense of the many. So this was the atmosphere that existed in America at this time. Now, four years later, after 1868, we have the presidential election of 1872, in which U.S. Grant will again run for president, this time against an individual by the name of Horace Greeley. Greeley didn't have much in the way of political experience. He was a an editor for a newspaper. But in that position, he had gained for himself a, a pretty good reputation. A reputation of cleaning up America.
Now, Grant supporters realized that Greeley was running against the last four years of Grant's presidency and all of the various different scandals that had taken place. And so they couldn't exactly run on the last four years. Instead, they're going to run a campaign of smearing Greeley. They will, for example, claim, and correctly so, that Greeley was an atheist at a time in which the vast majority of Americans were very religious. Certainly they wouldn't want an atheist at that time as President of the United States who knows what such an individual would do. There's a great deal of, and this isn't you know, my opinion, but they believed that an atheist had no morals, an individual who couldn't be trusted as a result. They also uh, were told that Greeley was one of those free lovers, a man who believed in sex without marriage. Good God, such a thing. They also proclaimed that Greeley was a vegetarian, and he probably was. And to us, vegetarian, nothing wrong with that today. But things have changed in 150-some-odd years. And at that time, people believed that if you weren't a red-blooded American who ate meat, you were weak-willed. We don't want a weak-willed individual to be President of the United States. They have to be strong and stand before the winds of outrage from other governments. They claimed a lot about this individual. They literally destroyed him. So much so that Grant will win by an even larger popular vote than he had in his first campaign, even though they were, they were all of these various different scandals. Sadly, with Greeley's defeat, his life will take a nosedive down, having been just beaten publicly. His whole life torn to shreds. Greeley will turn to drink to try and soothe his shattered nerves. He'll drink so much that he'll not be able to come into work. He'll lose his job as an editor on the paper. He'll then drink more, his wife will leave him, he'll drink more, his family will become so concerned over this that they will have him committed. And within a month, he'll be dead. So... Unfortunately, that is a very, very sad ending to his life. And a number of individuals will be faced with this same kind of situation. But unlike Greeley, they will realize that they can come back from it. They can do better. And uh, survive from this. Greeley was unable to do so. Not only is this era known as the era of good stealings, but it's also sometimes known as the Gilded Age. This comes from the title of a book written by Mark Twain, 
the author of books like um, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, or the uh, short stories The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, Mark Twain, the author of Huckleberry Finn, and Tom Sawyer. It's the story, of course, of the age of a boom-and-bust economy, an era in which there is large amounts of graft, crime, corruption in government. And yet it's also a period of time in which people will, even though they have little confidence in the people in their government, they have a great deal of confidence in their government itself. Voter turnout was generally extremely high in the 90 percentile bracket, unlike today where in some elections you might get 30 percent of the eligible voters actually vote. And at 30 percent, I'm not sure that even qualifies as, or below, I'm not sure if that qualifies as democracy any longer you're having only a very small number of individuals determine what the laws are going to be that all the rest of us live out under. But, in either case, at this time, voter turnout was extremely high. Women still weren't allowed to vote. It was all men doing the voting. And, as a result, the... various different gatherings for speeches and for other party activities would actually be quite raucous. There would be free alcohol served, there would be bands, food, all kinds of things, and it would be a, a point of being a party, a celebration. People were quite excited to go out and vote, go out and hear politicians speak. So the Gilded Age. Four years later, another election is held. This time, Grant is not going to run for re-election. Certainly he could have if he'd chosen to do so. There was no... Uh, constitutional amendment prohibiting him from doing so. He could have run and run and run over and over again if he'd so chosen. But by this time, he was already beginning to feel old from eight years as president. It kind of wears you down. In addition, he was beginning to suffer some of the problems that he will later die from. Uh, cancer. So he'll decide not to run. So both the Democrats and the Republicans will field two new candidates. And the Republicans, for their part, not having Grant, instead will run Rutherford B. Hayes, a man where politically not much was known about him, so that he was often referred to as the great unknown. But he was an individual with the right background, at that time. He was an officer in the Civil War who had been wounded several times, and he also came from the uh, Electoral College rich state of Ohio. So, in opposition to him, the Democrats will choose as their candidate Samuel J. Tilden, the man who had bagged Boss Tweed the man who had used his successfully prosecuting Boss Tweed as the prosecutor of uh, the city of New York to become the governor of New York and now uh, running as the candidate for the Democratic Party for president. When the votes are counted. 
Tilden will win more popular votes, some 250,000 more than that of Rutherford B. Hayes. But he was short by one electoral vote of winning. He had 184 and needed 185. Now, there were still some Southern votes that had not yet been counted. That would likely mean that that Tilden was going to win. But when a congressional gathering was put together to try and count these votes, everyone knew that who was put in charge of this, what political party they were, would determine where those votes were going to go. So the Republicans having a majority in Congress will work out a deal with the Democratic Party, telling them, look, hey, we're going to win this election. Hayes is going to become the new President of the United States. Now we know Tilden's got a lot of popular votes, but what we're going to do is we are going to get you a deal where you can live with Hayes as the President of the United States. The deal was that the Democrats would get a place at the feeding trough of the presidential patronage in civil service, those jobs in the federal government that paid well where you didn't have to do a whole lot so certain positions will be held open for the Democrats to reward people in their political party. Another offer of concession by the Republicans to allow their candidate to win was that they would support a bill in Congress subsidizing the building of a railroad that would run through the southern states. And, of course, wherever railroads were being built, money would flow. So the southern economy would pick up. Another thing was that the government would agree to end Reconstruction in the South. Federal troops would be withdrawn. The South would be allowed to go back and do whatever they wanted to do on their own without interference by the federal government. So the South, eager for all of these things to happen, probably gaining more than they might have with Tilden coming in as president, since Congress would still be dominated by the Republicans, they decide to back Hayes as the new president of the United States. This is known as the Compromise of 1877. So, Tilden's out, even though he wins. The popular vote should have won. The electoral vote as well. But Hayes is president. Now, when it came time to paying off the Democrats for... Hayes becoming president. Only one of those concessions that the Republicans had offered to the Democrats will actually be carried out. That, of course, is the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, the ending of Reconstruction. But that was enough. The South was satisfied. They could now do what they wanted to do in the South. Sadly, of course, this meant that uh, blacks in the South would be thrown under the bus, if you will. They would be left to uh, at the mercies, or lack of mercies, of uh, 
southern governments. And the number of blacks in the south voting began to decline rather rapidly. So the presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes, some of the things that will occur during his presidency, one of which is that Hayes was a noted teetotaler. He didn't uh, like alcohol, didn't abide by it. And his wife, Lucy Hayes, will, during the various different gatherings, uh, parties, celebrations, etc., that will take place, will ensure that alcohol isn't served, and instead soft drinks like lemonade will be served instead. So eventually newspapers will pick up on this and begin to give to Lucy a nickname, Lemonade Lucy. Other events that will take place during Hayes' presidency is a railroad strike in which the federal government will intervene to try and keep the railroads running because that was the route whereby much of the mail at that time was being delivered and the mail must go through. Other things of interest during Hayes' presidency includes the events in California around the backlash of Chinese immigration. Originally, Chinese were brought in to work on the railroads, and once the railroads were done, they would remain. and they would begin to bring in members of their family from China. And there were uh, quite a number of individuals in California who were resentful about this. People like Dennis Kearney, for example. Irish-born himself, an immigrant, resented the Chinese in California because they were cheap labor. And that meant that uh, others couldn't get the jobs because the Chinese would underbid for those jobs. So that created a, a bit of resentment. So California will push through Congress legislation limiting the number of Chinese that would be allowed to immigrate into the United States. However, when it was presented to the desk of the president, Rutherford B. Hayes, he will veto it, claiming that this was an iniquity, that it was wrong to do this to just one group of people. And that's a good thing. I mean, Hayes stood up for his beliefs, stood up for what he believed in. But... Four years later, of course, after he leaves office, it will be passed again by California, and in 1882, it will become law. So he'll only delay it for a while. Other than that, there really isn't a whole lot of lasting consequence that will happen during Hayes' presidency. So four years later, we've got another presidential election, and again, two new candidates. Hayes himself, having been stuck with the stigma of stealing the election of 1876, will decide not to run for re-election. And so again, two new candidates are presented. For the Democrats, they will choose as their candidate Winfield Hancock a Civil War veteran who had been wounded at Gettysburg. He had no real political experience. His only uh, experience was military. And recently he'd been a military governor in the South during Reconstruction. 
and uh, Southerners felt that he was uh, a good guy. He'd not overstepped his authority in the South when he'd been governor. For the Republicans, they'll choose James Garfield, a man who will be presented to the voters as kind of Lincoln-esque, as Garfield had been born in a log cabin, not too dissimilar to that of Lincoln. Garfield had struggled up from poverty, become fairly wealthy, mainly at first in his youth by driving mules, mules that were used to pull barges along canals. But his real claim to fame came when the Civil War had broken out. He had risen to become a major general. So he was a Civil War veteran, decorated, well-respected, fairly wealthy. And of course, he came from Ohio, a place that was rich in electoral votes. Garfield's vice presidential candidate was a guy by the name of Chester A. Arthur from New York. Again, a place with lots of votes, lots of electoral votes. Arthur was placed into the position by the new New York boss of bosses for the political party in New York. Roscoe Conkling. And Garfield felt, I'm sorry, uh, Arthur felt a sense of responsibility for having been chosen into this position by Conkling. A few weeks into Garfield's presidency, having won the election by less than 40,000 votes, very close election, will be murdered by Charles Gatou, a deranged office seeker who had blamed Garfield for his not being able to secure a public office. And with the death of Garfield, Chester A. Arthur becomes the new president of the United States. Now, Arthur had felt a sense of loyalty to Conkling previously, as he'd been appointed into this position as vice president by Conkling, but now that he was president, now that he had become president, not by virtue of the getting out the vote by Conkling, but rather by divine intervention, Arthur felt that he owed no one but God for his position. And so he will break with Conkling. Break with Conkling to the point where there will be near open warfare between the two of them. So there was a good deal of uh, acrimony between them. So it's not terribly surprising that in the 1884 election, Arthur will not stand for re-election, and a new candidate will be presented in his place. We'll have, for the Republicans, James G. Blaine, a individual who had uh, some political experience, but most of it came from his being a lawyer who worked for the railroad company and who had gained a good deal of money 
as a result of this. Now, working for the railroad company, most people believed that Blaine was an individual who was not above illegalities. And in fact, when some of his private letters were made public, they read as if Blaine was indeed trying to do a number of rather shady deals. Certainly, at the end of these various different letters, there would be the phrase, and make sure that you burn this letter afterwards. And most people took that as a sure sign that there was something in there that wasn't legal. Now, legally, of course, he being a lawyer knew exactly what he could and couldn't say that would get him into trouble. So they weren't exactly illegal, if you will. On the other hand, the uh, Democrats will choose as their candidate Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland had a long and illustrious political career. He'd been mayor of the city of Buffalo, New York. He'd been governor of the state of New York. But he had a colorful past as well, and that will be used in the political campaign. There's going to be a good deal of mudslinging that's going to be thrown around in these political campaigns at this time. If Blaine could have his private letters made public and people uh, shouting, uh, Blaine, Blaine, continental liar from the state of Maine, then the Republicans thought that they too should throw some mud on the Democratic candidate. And the mud that they will sling is that of the possibility that Grover Cleveland had fathered an illegitimate child, father to a child out of wedlock. Certainly, there was some smoke that people could point to. He had dated a woman for a while, who later became pregnant, though this was after they had stopped dating, and the fact that when she gave birth to a son, Cleveland will help her financially. Now, most people, <coughs> excuse me, most people looking at this situation would believe that Cleveland gave money to this woman because that was his son. Cleveland will claim that it isn't his son. Actually, he doesn't claim even that. He won't even dignify the questions. But he will assume full responsibility for the boy. Financially. Though he won't claim that he was the father of the child. In those days, this lack of morals was something that turned people's heads. But, won't be enough for him to lose the election. and He'll win, become President of the United States. A number of things that will take place during his presidency is that there will be a reduction in the tariff, so there will be cheap imported goods now, it will also be one of the few times in American history in which there will actually be a surplus in the Treasury. We'll be pulling in more money than we'll be spending. Well, I think we'll cut this video at this point. It's going on a bit long. Um, YouTube has a tendency to get a bit finicky if videos are too overly long. So we'll pick up from 
that point on.